Hey everyone, I'm Jean Chatsky. Thanks so much for joining me today on Her Money, where we talk about personal finance and how money touches everything in our lives. 11 years ago, and I gotta say, I cannot believe it's been that long. 11 years ago, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, hit bookshelves and frankly blew up a good part of the world, at least the world that I live in. Her feminist manifesto encouraged women to stop holding ourselves back from working to reach positions of power and instead lean in and lean on other women's experiences to help them. As the mother of two young kids when she wrote the book, her message was that, yeah, you can have it all if you want it bad enough. And I think it's undeniable that, at least in part, that book moved the needle for the first time in the history of the Fortune 500 list. More than 10% of Fortune 500 companies are led by women. However, it's also true that more than a decade later, women are pushing back on this lean-in approach that placed so much responsibility on us on individual women rather than on societal and economic structures surrounding us. Many are also questioning if they actually want to have it all in the first place. My guest today, Naomi Khan, has dedicated her life's work to studying how we can fix the systems that hold women back in the workplace and how Feminist theory intersects with the law. She is the Justice Anthony M. Kennedy Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law and the co-director of the Family Law Center. And she's got a new book out with co-authors June Carbone and Nancy Levitt called Fair Shake, Women and the Fight to Build a Just Economy. 6,060 Naomi, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. We are just as excited to have you. And you have been digging into this for a long time. You've been exploring how feminist theory intersects with the progress that women are and are not making. Where are we right now? Well, as you mentioned, there are more women than ever who are top CEOs in Fortune 500 companies. However, more than ever is still only about 10%. So women are maybe progressing at the top, but very, very slowly. In the meantime, the gender wage gap itself has barely budged over the past 30 years. That is the gap between men and women's pay. Women are still earning an average of 82% of what men earn. And so if we look overall, if we look at the entire economic spectrum, women are not increasing, women are not approaching equity in the way that one would have expected if one had started to look, say, in 1970. And the wage gap really was closing. But progress has stalled over the past 30 years or so. Why do you think that is? I mean, I've been following the wage gap, it feels like, for decades. Like you, I'm frustrated that it doesn't seem to move at all, even more than a little bit. Why do you think that it has stalled? And why don't you answer that and I'll follow it up because I've seen these studies that put the blame on the choices that women make Mm -hmm. and they frustrate me too. Well, yeah, exactly. As you said, the conventional explanation for women's lack of progress is the choices that we make in life. And then also there are those family responsibilities that we take on. So, and yeah, that is part of the explanation. If you look at what happens to mothers in the workplace after they have a child, they are more likely to leave the workplace, at least temporarily. So, There is something to the conventional explanation of family responsibilities and of women's choices. But when you dig down a little bit deeper and you look at women's choices, you wonder why women's professions are not paid as well as what have traditionally been defined as 
male professions. And then you start to dig a little bit deeper as we did, because what we were concerned about is that conventional explanation has always been there. But notwithstanding the conventional explanation, women had progressed between, say, 1960 and 1990. And what we wanted to look at is everything else being equal, why has women's progress stalled? And what we found is that even though women are increasingly likely to enter the workplace, what we found is all the highest paying sectors are male dominated. And even though women are more likely to be school teachers than computer scientists, that's not the full explanation. And it's what we did was we looked at why, for example, the percentage of female teachers reached a modern low in the early 90s and then has grown back since then. So there's been teaching has become more female dominated than it was 30 years ago. And so as we delved deeply into this, we kept on coming back to the same to the same problems. And what we did in the book is we looked at a series of court cases, uh, some at the Supreme Court, or one at the Supreme Court, um, uh, many in lower courts, and we occasionally talked to some of the people behind these cases. And wherever we looked, we found the, wherever we looked, we found the same story. We found the, what we identify as a winner-take-all economy, which holds women back. What does that mean, a winner-take-all economy, and how does it hold women back? So we're using the term winner-take-all economy to describe the critical shift in the new economy as the ability of those at the top to take a much larger share of institutional resources for themselves. This new economy crosses job sectors and it explains the patterns that had stumped us to try to explain why women's progress had stalled. I, what we talk about is the, the concept of a, a winner take all is not a new concept, of course, but we're looking at it as a way of saying that the, the winner take all world is a zero sum game that produces negative sum consequences. Can you so, give me an example? Because it's I, I it's feeling kind of kind of theoretical, and I'm trying to, as you're talking about it, distinguish it in my mind from sort of what we're dealing with income inequality. What happens is that there are internal competitions in workplaces. And the higher the stakes in the internal competition, the more likely it is that women will be pushed out. One of the companies that we discuss in the book is General Electric. And Jack Welch, who helmed GE for many years, was seen by many as a management guru. What he did, what he instituted, was a yank and rank or rank and yank system. So he would rank employees and he would yank the bottom 10%. So it became an internal competition to try to make sure that your job was not yanked. We profile an attorney who started out, who actually played the game, who was moving forward at GE and ultimately, at least in our telling, was pushed out by these internal competitions. When we look at these things happening on a small scale or on a large scale, and I'm, I'm very fascinated with the example that you gave about teachers, and I, I want to come back to it. But this feminist theory intersect with all of this and with the progress that we're making. I mean, it's a term that, for better or for worse, and I think for worse has become pretty loaded. One of, one of my colleagues, another law professor, talks about the F word. 
And she once wrote, and this is a quote from Professor Leslie Bender, feminists are perceived as bra burners, man haters, sexist, and castrators, as well as overly demanding and humorless. And end quote from Professor Bender. But <laughs> for many of us who think of ourselves as feminists, we certainly do not think of ourselves as sexist or castrators. We hope that we have at least some sense of humor. Uh, we are not bra burners or man haters. Instead, what we care about is greater gender equity. So we don't just care about women. We don't just care about men. We care about greater equity throughout the entire economy. And we look at the traditional power imbalance between men and women, and we say there is something rotten in that gender imbalance, and we would like to fix that. So we embrace feminism, we embrace feminist theory as a way of saying that we care about equality and equity. Feminism is the belief in the equality of people of all genders, a set of values aimed at undoing gender inequality and the structures that support it. It encompasses a variety of different perspectives. There's not one feminist theory, but the idea is to move towards gender equity. And it's become increasingly important certainly in our economy, certainly in our personal lives, and certainly, as we've seen with the Supreme Court, with respect to reproductive justice and equality. Yeah, absolutely. As you were describing your colleague's definition of a, of a feminist, I was smiling in my head because I certainly don't think of myself as a castrator, but I don't even think of myself as a bra burner. I'm very uncomfortable without a bra. Something that my listeners probably did not need to know, but we'll tell them anyway. This is a judgment-free zone. You and your co-authors, you talk about something in the book that you call the triple bind. That if women, and this is straight out of the book, if women don't compete on the same terms as men, they lose. If women do compete on the same terms as men, they're punished more harshly for their sharp elbows or actual misdeeds. And when women see that they can't win on the same terms as men, they take themselves out of the game if they haven't been pushed out already, like the lawyer at GE that you write about. So how do we put ourselves in situations where this is not the case? <laughs> I mean, when you're trying to take care of your own personal economy, right? I know I can't do anything about the interest rate. I can't do anything about the stock market. But I do have some control over my own personal economy in where I choose to look for work how I choose to navigate that career. Granted, I'm fortunate, I'm college educated, I know that I have a lot of privilege. But as we look to try to get a fairer shake for ourselves, how do we maneuver? Yeah, that's a really important question. I think that we all struggle with, right? And you know, there's no one size fits all response. I, I think what we found, you started us out by talking about lean, leaning in. One response is, well, we need to fix the system. Fixing the system, of course, does not help us in our day-to-day -day lives. But I think there are ways of making changes in our immediate environment. So one, one big thing, and I know others have said the same thing to you, but file allies and mentors. So finding allies and mentors, both within the place that you are working, but also outside of the place that you're working. So finding allies and mentors at other companies, we're all parts of so many overlapping communities. So reaching out to our communities for support, but 
so many studies have shown that finding allies and mentors can help us get ahead as well as help us maintain our sanity. So, so finding community both within and outside of work is absolutely critical. There's also, at, at, at some point, and we, we all hope we never get to that point, but if we are asked to do something that we find so morally repugnant that we can't do it, then it's time to draw on that network of allies and mentors and figure out another place to be where we are not going to be called on to do that, where we don't have to cheat to get ahead. It also, the the people that we profile in our book had the courage to stand up. And I'll say, as someone who used to represent plaintiffs in employment discrimination cases, those cases are tough. Yeah. It takes an enormous amount of courage to find someone to represent you, to file a complaint, to go to court, to go through all of the questioning that goes with bringing one of these cases. So it's certainly not something that many of us will do, or even that many of us should aspire to do. But it's also possible, if other people are in the same position, to build community within work, to work with other people in your workplace, and to try to make changes together. Because chances are, if you're experiencing someone, so is someone else working close by with you. So building a sense of community, finding strength in that community is something that we can all do in our workplaces. Um, when you are approached or when you were approached to take on a case by somebody who felt that they were let go or fired and had a case, how did you figure out if in fact they did? I'm thinking about this. I have a good friend who was just let go in a round of layoffs from a large consulting firm after almost more than 30 years there. She took a look at the lay of the land. Most of the people let go were over 50. Many were women. But you know, knowing that a, a large consulting firm is absolutely going to run the numbers and figure out the proportion of people that they're allowed to let go of before they have a problem legally, she figured, you know, I'll just get the best package that I can mm -hmm. and not and not go down that road. But when do you know that you actually have a case? In some ways, you don't actually know that you have a case until you get that ultimate decision from the court saying you've got a case. There are certainly laws that will protect it. It sounds like your friend might have had a case perhaps of both sex discrimination and possibly age discrimination because age discrimination protections attach to at the age of 40. But there's a lot that goes into the decision of someone like your friend actually to move forward to bring a case. It can take years to work for a case to work its way through the courts. And during that time, I know I'm making this sound like a really appealing process. Yeah, no, nobody's um, going to sue. And nobody's going to do it. Uh, but you are making, if, if you succeed, you, you can make changes. There are very strong laws that protect against sex discrimination, that protect against sexual harassment. But it can become, it can be an arduous process. On the other hand, we tell the stories of people who went to see lawyers and filed their complaints and very soon thereafter there were settlements because the company as well, again I'm speculating here, but the companies themselves don't like facing this kind of action against them. They don't like facing this kind of publicity and they also know that this will take time from management to pursue. And so so there is, the, the cases don't necessarily drag on for years. And it's certainly worth talking to 
an attorney just to, I'm not trying to drum up business, I promise. I am no longer <laughs> representing clients, um, uh, but, but it might be worth talking to an attorney to find out if there is a case to be brought and what that case might consist of. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I want to dig into women in the financial services industry, which you write about, you cover in depth in the third chapter of the book. You get into the enormous hurdles that women working in the financial industry face. This is top of mind right now as the Wall Street Journal recently published a story about women being passed over for top jobs at Goldman Sachs and documenting the fact that two-thirds of the women who were partners at the end of 2019 have left the firm or no longer have the title of partner and they cite a lot of instances of the sort that you talk about in the book. You said this is a problem because when we look at gender gaps in all occupations, and again, this is right out of the book, the top job categories are all in finance. What's it going to take to fix the financial services industry? It's going to take a lot to fix the financial services industry. Uh, the areas of the financial services industry the, the, is one of those areas of the economy where pay has increased most dramatically in the last 30 years. And so that's also seen a huge increase in the, the winner take all economy. It used to be one of the things we talk about in the book is in the 1950s, we had something called the organization man, the man in the gray flannel suit. And yes, he was a man. But one of the things he said was, my company produces better products than yours. So you can contrast that today with what happens in the financial sector, where I think the brag is, my bonus is bigger than yours. Mm -hmm. And so we've moved from looking at company health as a whole to focusing on individual financial success. And if you look at, th there were many things wrong with the organization man, many things wrong with the man in the gray flannel suit. Not the least of them was that it was generally a white man wearing the gray flannel suit. But there was something beneficial. There was less income inequality. The gap between CEO and average worker was much smaller than it is today. And this idea that I'm putting my company first as opposed to my individual gain, I think is a quite different mindset from what we see in the financial sector. And so it's going, it's a, it's a makeover, it's a do-over to change financial services. But I think the first step is more transparency and learning about what happened at Goldman Sachs is hopefully gonna be a wake-up call, not just to Goldman Sachs, but to other companies in the financial sector. There's been a movement towards sustainability investing, towards ESG slash sustainability. And I know it's incredibly controversial. Some people might dismiss it as window dressing, but I'll take that window dressing. I'll take that. Let's start at least thinking about these issues because being transparent, starting these conversations is how we're going to bring about change. And true confession, we started the book before Me Too. But so as we were writing the book, Me Too completely transformed so much of yeah. what we were thinking about. Oh, I, I am sure. <laughs> and, and, and I think you're right. There's so many different lenses that you can apply to the way that you look in the world. I, I lead a, an investing club called Investing Fix for several hundred women where we're learning about fundamentals of picking investments. And we've dug into ESG, sustainability, it's not the only lens that we use, but it is certainly a fascinating one, an important one, and one that we feel we should understand before just dismissing it outright, as, as so many stories have, have seemed to do lately. At, at the end of the book, 
you offer some solutions to push back on the winner-take-all economy. And I wonder if we could talk about some of those steps and how we might start putting some of them into practice. The smaller ones, the more manageable ones in our, in our daily lives are things like getting the lay of the land at your workplace, finding others who, who think like you, finding a job where you can, if, if not always live out your values, at least not, doesn't completely undermine your values at the same time as you recognize that that you, you are in working in this economy. So, so there are changes at the micro level that you can make. You can speak out. You can, if, if you see someone else being harassed, you, you, can speak, you, you can support that person. You can be an ally to that person. So there are many things we can do individually. We also have a whole bunch of much more global solutions of what can be done. I mean, there are other things that you can do, which are, one of my friends was one of the first men at his law firm to take parental leave. Mm. He ultimately made partner, but people were kind of surprised that he had done this. So making sure that we share responsibilities if we have children, making sure we share child care responsibilities, making sure we share home care responsibilities if we are in a relationship. So, so there are changes. I mean, there are changes both in the workplace. There are changes in our individual lives as well that we could do outside of the, the workplace when it comes to work-life family balance. Increasing the minimum wage so that we can help Women are much more likely than men to be paid at or below the minimum wage. So that's increasing the minimum wage will have an impact on women as as well as men. That's happening, of course, in some states, but at the federal level, it has not happened in decades. Uh, We talk about investing in individuals, in children, and in communities through, for example, better child tax credits like what we saw during the pandemic and which are currently starting to happen. We talk about, and then as lawyers, one of our final recommendations is strengthening the rule of law. And so everything from strengthening current protections against discrimination, ending some of the mandatory arbitration procedures that we still see that prevent people from going to court or that prevent people from speaking up, ending confidentiality agreements so that people can learn about the successes of others, and overall ensuring that we maintain a democratic system in our country. We've talked a lot about people who work for companies. Before before I let you go, we've had a rise in workers who are participants in the gig economy, Mm -hmm. who don't have that sort of a framework. And it is it, it can be very appealing when it comes to looking for ways to to raise a family. But you write in the book that that gig would gig workers are also more vulnerable to economic instability. What would you say to women who are wondering if a freelance life is better for them? There is so much to be said for job flexibility. And I think everybody appreciates having as much flexibility in a job as possible. And it certainly does help with raising children. And so the gig economy has all kinds of appeal for purposes of you set your own hours. So it's definitely a really good option for so many people who may have at least temporarily dropped out of the workplace. It's a way to start to build up credentials again, to start to re-enter the workplace, but to do it very much on your own terms. So one of the people we didn't profile in the book, but we interviewed, started her own dog walking agency. And so she was able to 
She was able to walk dogs when she wanted to. She was able to set her own time and her own terms and the amount of money that she was receiving. But she also had to pay a lot for health care, mm -hmm. right? Because the gig economy doesn't come with insurance provided health care. You have to pay your own social security taxes. And so in terms of long-term retirement security, that's it's important to continue to pay those taxes so that money will be there when you need it at a later point in your life. So there are the, the lack of benefits is of course one of the downsides. It's also studies have found that women underprice themselves in the gig economy that if you give if you look at the same job a man is likely to charge more than a woman even if they have substantially identical credentials and are doing substantially identical work. So another piece of advice is don't undersell yourself value your own talents and make sure that if, if it's one of those where you're setting your own pay, make sure you set it appropriately. Look at what others are earning. And I should say the person we interviewed who started her own dog walking agency has ultimately decided to go back to school to get another degree because she does want more security in her life and she wants access to all of those benefits that come with a full-time job. Naomi Khan, fascinating. If you had to look out 20 years from now, what do you think what do you think the world will look like? Where will we be in terms of economic parity for women? Well, let's start with what I hope. <laughs> what I hope is that we will be that stubborn gender pay gap which remains stuck between 80 to 82 cents. That's going to start to decrease and that women will start to get paid more in comparison to men, that the gender pay gap will decrease. I'm going to hope that instead of 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs being women, that in 20 years we might not be up to 50%, but even if we're not there, that we've moved up dramatically from 10%. And not only that, that the pipeline into those CEO positions is also robust. So I'm hoping for that. I'm hoping for, as I said, that we increase the minimum wage throughout the country so that at least everybody is earning a livable wage. I am hoping for paid family and medical leave for everyone in some states, that's a reality, but certainly not in all states and not at the federal level. I am also hoping for reproductive rights and justice. That too will change. Our understanding of that is certainly quite prominent right now as we think about those issues. Again, I know there are many different varieties of that, but whatever it means, supporting the choice to have a family and supporting that family once there is a family. So I'm hoping for all of those things. I am right there with you. The book is called Fair Shake, Women and the Fight to Build a Just Economy. You should all pick it up. Naomi, thank you so much for, for being here with us today and for all of the great information. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure.